Hello again. You're probably wondering where we are right now. This is Challenger Deep, the deepest point in the ocean. This inconceivable void in a void in a void sits nearly seven miles below sea level, deep enough that you could put Mount Everest at the bottom, and its peak would still be so deep that zero light from the sun would reach it not a single photon, a place that no ordinary creature would want to journey. But you and I, we aren't your ordinary creature. We are humans, and we believe that everything that exists should belong to us. And because of this mentality, 27 people have managed to get down here. Granted, way more have been to space, and nearly as many have gone to the moon, but it feels like it should be more, given how seemingly close it is. But it isn't like you can just get up one morning and decide to travel seven miles into the abyss like you would go on a seven mile hike. Nah. We as a species had to spend thousands of years learning and developing ways of getting underwater and staying there. And most importantly, getting back to the surface alive. Through a lot of trial and error, innovation, and learning about new, fun, exciting ways you can die, we're going to discover how exactly we went from looking out into the water with curiosity to touching down at the ocean's deepest point, a point known as full ocean depth. This is going to be a five-part series that looks into the history, biology, and physics of getting deeper in the ocean, and the technological leaps that let us get further and further down. If you're looking forward to that, please consider subscribing, as these will be the most ambitious videos I have made up to this point. Today's episode is going to focus on how far we can get without any kind of breathing equipment. How far down we can get off of just a single breath. Before we can begin our descent, we need to better understand the physics of diving deep and what it might do to our bodies. Here's a law you will need to learn and remember for this episode and the entire series. This is Boyle's Law, and it is used to calculate how pressure and volume affect each other. Long story short, they are inversely related. What this means is when pressure increases, volume will decrease. And when pressure decreases, volume will increase. You might have experienced this before. Take a bag of Lay's original potato chips on a plane, because I know you don't want to eat those, and observe it while you're still on the tarmac. Give it a poke. You can push your finger in easily and manipulate the bag. Now put it away and wait until you reach your cruising altitude of 36,000 feet, coincidentally about the depth of Challenger Deep. Take it out and make another observation. The bag should look like it's ready to explode. This is because your bag of chips is currently exemplifying another scientific concept you will need to remember for the remainder of this series. Its internal pressure is 14.7 pounds per square inch, or one atmosphere, which is the same pressure it had on the ground, the atmospheric pressure we experience at sea level. Meanwhile, the cabin pressure of the aircraft is only about 10.9 pounds per square inch, the equivalent of 8,000 feet. It's not the same as it would be at 36,000 feet because air pressure there is 3.3 pounds per square inch and you would be dead. But the cabin pressure is regardless less than your bag of chips. The bag looks like it's going to get you on a no-fly list because the air molecules inside are more spread out to match or try to match the PSI inside the aircraft cabin. Let's head back to sea level you are once again exposed to those 14.7 pounds per square inch, equivalent to one atmosphere. This concept should be self-explanatory to most, but to those that haven't caught on, one atmosphere means the weight of the air above your head at sea level. The air from the ground all the way up to the edge of space, about 62 miles, weighs 14.7 pounds over any given square inch of the Earth. But enough with the air. Let's get in the water. Wait a minute. Water. Water is different from air. It seems obvious enough, but this is a very, very important distinction to make. Because water is more dense than air, 
one atmosphere's worth of water, 14.7 psi, will not be 62 miles down. It will be less. But how much less? Maybe every 30 miles we had an atmosphere? No? Maybe 10? 5? Maybe every mile? No. One atmosphere's worth of seawater is a mere 33 feet deep, or 10 meters. 33 feet down, you are experiencing two atmospheres, 29.4 psi, 14.7 from the atmosphere, and another 14.7 from the unforgiving water around you. I have personally gone scuba diving to 100 feet, about 4 atmospheres, or 58.8 psi, and I can tell you, when you're kicking your fins at 100 feet, you can tell the difference from when you're at the surface. But remember our goal, Challenger Deep. 35,876 feet, 1,088 atmospheres, 1,087 from the water, one from the air. That puts us at just shy of 16, thousand psi eight tons that's the weight of a school bus on every square inch of your body it certainly goes without saying but getting to full ocean depth is going to be much harder than we thought if we're going to do this thing we need to solve problems as we come across them and to figure out what those problems are we need to start experimenting Let's begin with freedivers. They submerge themselves for no more than a couple minutes, reaching potentially hundreds of feet deep. But they don't always come back up. And even if they do, sometimes they go unconscious even after surfacing. So what kills them? Could it be the crushing pressure I mentioned earlier? It's a fair guess given what I've told you, but no. If we manage to recover a deceased freediver, their body is still intact. It does have to do with Boyle's Law, but physics is only half the picture. It's time to talk biology. Air-breathing vertebrates, that's mammals, birds, reptiles, and amphibians, store oxygen in three places. The muscles, the blood, and the lungs. Lungs take in oxygen, giving it to the blood, which then transports it to the rest of the body, including the muscles. In order to keep your brain conscious, oxygen concentration in the blood needs to stay above 27 millibars. Easy enough to understand. When we dive down in the ocean, our bodies act like that potato chip bag in reverse. We don't have rigid bodies. Virtually any change in pressure will affect your entire body. Don't worry, you won't get crushed into jelly at these relatively shallow depths. But it is important to understand how the pressure affects your oxygen stores. One of these is not like the others. And if you guessed the lungs, you would be correct. Muscles are made of fluid-filled cells, and blood is itself a fluid, with blood cells that are, again, filled with fluid. That brings us to the lungs, which are instead filled with air. When you dive down and pressure increases, your lungs are going to compress as the air in them becomes more dense. Your muscles and blood will not compress very much, as fluid is much harder to compress than air. Those freedivers that go for record-setting depths practice something known as exhale diving. This is where you take long, deep breaths just before exhaling all the air in your lungs, followed by your descent. In doing this, you have successfully saturated your muscles and blood with oxygen, while also making it much easier for your body to sink by removing the buoyant air that was in your lungs in gas form. The oxygen in your muscles and blood has bonded with myoglobin and hemoglobin respectively, no longer in gas form and not providing any buoyancy. After reaching your target depth, you have likely exhausted much of your oxygen stores and need to service. Here comes the killer, disguised as a savior, your ascent. Remember, when pressure decreases, such as in your swim to the surface, volume increases. And what exactly is increasing in volume right now? Your lungs. And those lungs need to be filled with something in order to expand. 
what to fill with. What to fill with. Let's just take the oxygen from your blood. And what do you mean you've blacked out? Hey, you. You're finally awake. You were trying to cross the- Breathe. <gasps> when you ascended, your lungs increased in volume by draining the oxygen that was in your blood, dropping the blood oxygen concentration below 27 millibars and starving your brain of the precious element. But let's say you make it all the way up without blacking out. You are still not out of the woods yet, or reef in this case. Because your lungs are filled with stale air that you used up on your dive and need to be emptied before you breathe again. So despite exhaling just before your dive, you must exhale again. And in doing so, you have just lowered the oxygen concentration in your blood even further. Even after taking in breaths, it takes time for the oxygen in the blood to rise back up. And you may still black out. Man, that makes things look bleak. Surely other air breathers have the same problems, right? Well, let's have a look. Many mammals, like cetaceans and pinnipeds, birds like penguins, and reptiles like sea turtles, have evolved to dive deep and stay deep for long periods of time. But what do they do that we don't? It's all about those oxygen stores. That and something I didn't mention earlier. Heart rate. First, oxygen storage. About a quarter of the oxygen we store is in our lungs. That's because our lungs are big. Our massive lungs allow us to replenish our blood and muscles with oxygen easily, provided we can readily get another breath. Fortunately, we live on land, so that breath is always waiting for us. But for our pelagic pals, they can't rely on that next breath of air. Not when they're hunting at mind-boggling depths. They need to make the most of the air they get at the surface. And so their lungs are relatively small, instead relying on high amounts of myoglobin and hemoglobin to store as much oxygen as possible. They have also evolved the ability to shut down non-essential organ systems when diving, so as to further reduce the amount of oxygen being used. Heart rate is the other important factor in making that breath count. The average adult human has a resting heart rate ranging from 60 to 100 beats per minute, but that changes when we submerge ourselves in the water. There's a mechanism known as diving bradycardia, in which the heart slows down when the body is underwater so as to reduce the speed at which oxygen is used. This mechanism is also called the dive reflex, or mammalian dive reflex, but I prefer the former. The latter doesn't give enough credit to our flightless friends and cold-blooded conquerors of the deep, because they do this too. In fact, all air-breathing vertebrates have this ability, whether or not they'll ever actually need to use it. Human hearts decrease their beats per minute while underwater, and while it varies by the person, it might hang around 45 beats per minute, maybe 30 if you're particularly fit. But if you think that's impressive, Take a look at something like the elephant seal. On the surface, they have a heart rate of maybe 80 to 110 beats per minute. But once it's submerged, there's a very different story. They typically get about a third of what their heart rate was on the surface, but some have been measured at almost an inconceivable 3 beats per minute. With all of this information, let's see how far down we've gotten. The deepest dive by a human being on a single breath of air was set in 2007 by a guy named Herbert Nietzsche to a mind-boggling depth of 702 feet. I will never again make fun of someone named Herbert. Emperor penguins are the deepest diving birds and put humans to shame, reaching depths of 400 meters, about 1300 feet. Among reptiles, there's no competition. The leatherback sea turtle reaches a nutty 4,000 feet, aided by its flexible shell that provides its namesake, resistant to crushing unlike its rigid-shelled cousins. However, the deepest diving, air-breathing animal goes back to a mammal. Cuvier's beaked whale 
is on record diving to a truly reality warping 9,816 feet, almost two miles, and held its breath for well over three hours. And if other animals can get this far down, surely we can do it too, with all our brains and centuries of science and technology. But if we're going to do this, we can't make it on a single breath. Somehow, we need to breathe underwater. But that will have to wait until next time. Thank you all so much for watching. I've never really done something like this before, especially not something that focused on science other than marine biology. I was primarily inspired to make this series after my reread of Bill Strever's book In Oceans Deep, which goes over many of the topics I'll be covering over these five videos. Many of the things he discusses in the book I won't be spending too much time on and vice versa, so if you really enjoyed this episode, please consider subscribing and also pick up his book because I really couldn't recommend it enough to anyone else who has a passion for this kind of thing. Before I close out this video, I need to tell you guys how thankful I am of all of you watching my Subnautica review and leaving so many supportive comments. When I uploaded that video, I expected it to get maybe a maximum of 500 views, a thousand stretching it. But right now as I record this, just under a week after uploading it, the video is sitting at 45.6 thousand views. In one week, you guys have turned this dream of mine into a reality. And I cannot remember a time in recent memory I felt this happy or accomplished with my life. Anyway, that's all I got for today. You all have yourselves a good one, and I hope you learned something.